when Quraysh realizes that the Prophet is not backing down, he is firm and he's getting more and more followers, he's not willing to negotiate with us, he's not compromising with us, he's firm in advancing this mission, they resort to violence and torture. They begin to torture Muslims who had no one to protect them. So if a member of a tribe would become Muslim in Mecca, that tribe would torture him, pressure him, ostracize him, imprison him, hold him captive, or even starve him. They would withhold food from him. That was a way to pressure him to stop following the Prophet to renounce the message of Islam. By the way, amongst those who was known to torture some early Muslims was Umar ibn al-Khattab, right? This is before he embraced Islam. He was known to torture Muslims. Tabari narrates that there was a woman from Bani Mu'ammal or Mu'ammal from that tribe. They come from the larger tribe of Bani Adi or Uday. She had declared her Islam. She was owned by that tribe. Umar took it upon himself to beat her and torture her until he would get tired. Her name, uh, she, the name is not mentioned, she is a woman from Bani Mu'ammal. Maybe you'll, I could probably find her name in the works of biography but generally speaking her name is not mentioned. She was a woman from the tribe of Bani Mu'ammal. He would torture her. He would beat her until he would become tired. When he would become tired, do you know what he would tell her? He says, I apologize to you that I had to stop because I can no longer beat you anymore. He would say that to her, yeah? He was very rough. He would torture her until he literally could not continue anymore. His hands had no energy and her, tri her tribe allowed Umar to do that to her as a punishment for her. Why did you become Muslim? Why did you embrace the message of the Prophet Just try to imagine what happened to those early Muslims. Imagine what they had to go through. You know these days we Muslims were living in our comfortable lives and then for petty things we lose patience, oh it's so difficult to be religious, it's so difficult to observe our obligations. We have no clue what those early Muslims had to go through. Do we have to go through any of this? Even with all this Islamophobia, do you have to go through 1% of this honestly? No, and there's no one to protect you, no one. No one can protect you, no one has the power to protect you. Amongst those families who were severely persecuted by the Meccans was the family of Yasir. They were amongst the early Muslims who were persecuted and tortured. They were humble, they were very weak, they didn't have any family or tribe in Mecca. It seems that they embraced the religion of Islam after about 30 companions. So they were amongst the very early Muslims, amongst the first 30, 40 Muslims to become, first 30, 40 companions to become Muslim were the family of Yasir. Ammar was the first one to become Muslim. Ammar ibn Yasir, he hears about the message of the Prophet He goes to the house of Arqam. Remember the house of Arqam, it was the headquarters for the mission of the Prophet in those early years. Ammar hears about them message of the Prophet, he's so thirsty to learn from the Prophet. So he goes to the house of Arqam, he meets the Prophet he asks the Prophet, tell me what is this new religion? The Prophet explains to him what Islam is, he reads to him verses from the Quran, he becomes Muslim. When he becomes Muslim, he takes the message to his family. His father Yasir becomes Muslim, his mother Sumayya becomes Muslim, his brother Abdullah becomes Muslim. What a blessed family, really the first family in Islam, all the members of the family they joined the religion of Islam. 
the two parents and the two brothers. And that was really a great honor for the family of Yasser. Now the tribe of Bani Makhzum would torture them. Sumayya initially was a slave. Sumayya, the mother of Ammar, initially was a slave. Then Yasser, Yasser was a free man. Yasser marries her later, then he has children from her. But they didn't really have a strong tribe to protect them. They were weak, people who were exploited in their society. The tribe of Bani Makhzum would torture the family of Yasser. So what they would do, they would get them in the hot summer days, at the time of noon, when the ground of Mecca is scorching hot. You know, I've, you've seen videos in Iraq and in Saudi Arabia, they literally can cook an egg on the ground. You can fry an egg on it. That's how hot it is. It's very hot. You can't walk on it. You'll burn your feet. They would take them without their clothes, like their back exposed, and they would have them sleep on the ground, either on their belly or on their back. That was daily torture for the family of Yasser. They would do this to Yasser, to his wife Sumayya, to his son Ammar. Daily, daily torture. Ibn Hisham narrates, Ibn Hisham the historian, he narrates that sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would pass by that scene. You know this was very difficult for the Prophet to see. When you see your early companions suffer like that, imagine what happens to you. He would pass by them, he had no supporter, he couldn't do anything, this is a big tribe. He would pass, pass by them, seeing them being tortured, he would say, Sabran ala yasir fa inna mawidakum al jannah. O oh, family of Yasser, have patience. Jannah awaits you. Paradise awaits you. He would try to comfort them. He would try to give them patience. Now Sumayya was a very firm believer in Allah. No amount of torture would stop her from saying, La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. They would try to force her to worship the idols. She would reject. No amount of torture would move this amazing woman. And from believing in the Holy Prophet they imposed on her to worship the idols, she rejected. Abu Jahl, Abu Jahl the Prophet calls him the Pharaoh of this Ummah. That's how evil he was. Abu Jahl took it upon himself to torture her. He's torturing her severely. Stop worshiping in the one God. Worship in Lat wal Uzza, say Lat and Uzza, the names of their idols. Denounce Muhammad, attack Muhammad, condemn him. She would not. He takes a big boulder and he puts it on her as she's suffering. She would not. Nothing would move this amazing lady until this evil enemy of God, he takes out a spear, a dagger, and he stabs her below the belly and she bleeds to death and she becomes the first shaheed in Islam. The first one who died in Mecca in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was Sumayya, this amazing lady. Even in those moments, she would not stop. Shortly after Yasir, her husband is tortured to death and he becomes the second shaheed. Now Ammar is looking at the scene. Imagine your parents die in that way. He saw them being tortured to death before his eyes. They came after him. Oh Ammar, you saw what we did to your parents. This is not a joke, we're serious, we're going to kill you. Ammar was in his 20s around this time. He was a young man. He couldn't handle the torture anymore. There was psychological torture on him seeing his parents die. And on top of that, the physical torture, he couldn't handle it. So they told him, we'll kill you or reject the one God, condemn Muhammad, we'll save you. Under immense, immense pressure, Ammar does what they want to save his life. He says, okay, la and he denounces the Prophet 
they free him, they let him go. But Ammar is burning inside. How did I do that? Some narrations state for a while he did not show himself to the Prophet He was so ashamed until he comes to the Prophet The Prophet tells him, how are you Ammar? He tells him, I'm not good. I'm not good at all. I'm in evil. I'm in badness. He tells him, why? What happened? He tells the Prophet what happened. He tells him, Ya Rasulullah, they tortured me, they killed my parents in front of me as you know. I couldn't take it anymore and I just said it. The Prophet ﷺ, he told him, how's your heart? He says, my heart is fixed in faith, mutma'in, confident, 100%. The Prophet tells him, in that case, if they torture you again, do what you did again. Do what you did again to save your life. When the Prophet tells him that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals verse 106 of Surah An-Nahl, the bee. Allah reveals this verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man kafara billahi min ba'di imanih. Allah is attacking those who lose faith after believing in God and the Prophet. Allah makes an exception. Illa man ukraha except the one who's coerced, who's forced, but his heart is full of faith. His heart is fixed with Iman. They're an exception. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises what Ammar did. In honor of what Ammar did, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals a verse in the Holy Quran. Now this incident, as you just mentioned, referred to it, establishes the validity of what? Taqiyyah. We have something called Taqiyyah. And the followers of Ahlul Bayt have historically been condemned and attacked because of Taqiyyah. When Taqiyyah was instituted early in Mecca, we're talking about a few years after Ba'tha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala institutes, establishes the permissibility of Taqiyyah. Basically, Taqiyyah means when you're in danger whether you or your family, if you're in danger, or even your property is in danger, you're allowed to conceal your real faith, to protect your life and the life of your family. That's taqiyah. Allah praises it. Allah says, accept the one who's forced, he's in danger but his heart is full of Iman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually praises that in the Holy Quran. Now remember Ammar, he condemned the Prophet under torture, right? Condemning the Prophet, is that a normal sin? It's a big sin. That makes you leave Islam. Someone slanders the Prophet, you can no longer be a Muslim. How do you say Ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah when you're condemning the Prophet? It's heresy, it's kufr, but Allah praises it in the Quran. Why? Because it was in taqiyah, it was in the circumstance of taqiyah. He did not mean it, his heart was full of faith, he even felt bad about it, but he did so to save his life because they told him we'll kill you. That's taqiyah. And the Imams of Ahlul Bayt instructed their followers, the Shia, to practice taqiyah throughout history when they live in hostile environments, hostile governments, you have to practice taqiyah. Now, is taqiyah optional or is it mandatory? It depends on the situation. If you're asked to condemn Allah or the Prophet or Imam Ali alayhi salam, we've seen that happening throughout history, right? If you're forced to condemn them, to slander them, taqiyah is optional here. You can choose to do taqiyah and that's fine. And you can choose to die in that way and you become a shaheed. That's also fine. Yes. So why? that's why what uh, Sumayya and her husband did, they did not do taqiyah. They became shaheed. Ammar did taqiyah, Quran praised him. So both is allowed. It's optional. 
Are they equal in the eyes of God? That's a good question. It also depends. The reason why maybe Sumeya and Yasser's sacrifice was important is that it came at a very critical time. See, sometimes the religion is strong, right? Religion is strong. Whether I sacrifice or not, it's not going to make a big difference for the religion. The religion is strong, it has many followers. Scholars say in this case, it's better to do taqiyya. You can still, you know, in, in one hadith, the Imam Ali salam was asked about two people who were asked to condemn Imam Ali salam. So the Imam Ali salam said one of them did taqiyya, Allah rewarded him. The other one, he rushed to heaven. He went to heaven. So both is allowed. It depends on their circumstances. When Sumayya and Yasir made that sacrifice, it really boosted the morale of Muslims. It's, it, it, it scared the Quraysh. Wow, these Muslims are willing to go that far for this religion? It really made them think twice about the seriousness of this religion. So it was really instrumental. Their sacrifice was instrumental. So if religion, uh, the, the safety of religion does not depend on it, it's better to do taqiyya, but it's still optional. So that's optional taqiyya. If you're required to condemn Allah or the Prophet or the Imam, it's optional. Depending on the circumstances, doing taqiyya may be better or sacrificing may be better. Uh, Hijr ibn Adi, how many of you, Hijr ibn Adi, how many of you have heard of him? When Muawiyah forced Hijr and his companions to condemn Imam Ali alayhi salam, they refused. They were killed one after the other. This was, I believe, at the time of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. Yes. They were going to kill him and his son. He made a request, start with him first. He was told why. He said, I'm sure I'm not going to waver. But I don't know. I want to leave this world knowing my son died on the right path. In Syria, remember ISIS, they exhumed his body. Well, they tried to dig his grave. They couldn't. But they tried to exhume his body. Now there's another verse in the Holy Quran which establishes the permissibility of taqiyya. That's Surah Ghafir verse 28. رَجُلٌ مُؤْمِنٌ مِنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنَ يَكْتُمُ إِيمَانَهُ there was a man from the relatives of Fir'aun, he was a believer. He's the one who was giving them advice to believe in Prophet Musa alayhi salam. It was his wife uh, who was working in the palace of the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh killed her and her four children. In any case, Allah says a person from the relatives of Fir'aun, يَكْتُمُ إِيمَانَهِ He conceals his faith. So Allah is actually praising this person that he is a believer, but he conceals his faith. That's taqiyya, he did taqiyya. He did not reveal to the Pharaoh and the people that he believed in Musa. He would, you know, play along with them. He would even attend their, you know, idol worshipping ceremonies or when they would worship Fir'aun. He did that in taqiyya, the Qur'an actually praises him for that. So Ammar was really a great companion who did taqiyya. He was the first to do taqiyya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised him for that. The Prophet loved him dearly. He was a very close companion to the Prophet. In one hadith, the Prophet told him, Oh Ammar, taqtulika al-fi'atul baghiya or al-firqatul baghiya. Oh Ammar, let me tell you who's going to kill you. The, uh, the aggressive, oppressive group will kill you. Companions would always wonder who's going to kill Ammar, especially after the fitna during the time of Imam Ali salam. Who's on the right path? Is Aisha and Muawiyah on the right path or is Imam Ali in the right path? The Khawarij, are they on the right path? People were anxious to know who's going to kill Ammar because the Prophet informed the companions and everyone that the evil ones will kill Ammar comes the day of Safin. The battle that occurred between Muawiyah and Imam Ali alayhi salam. Muawiyah knew that as well. Muawiyah knew that very well, but he didn't care. But he, didn't, he didn't care. He did not care at all, evil. He knew that he was the Baghi, 
the, aggre the aggressor. Ammar, in that battlefield, all the companions were watching him. Wherever he'd go, even if he'd go through a valley, they follow him, the good companions. Because they knew that Ammar is going to get killed in this battle. Remember, Ammar at this time was, was in his 90s. Old, very old at the time. They were following him. Everywhere he'd go because he knew they knew they'd, he'd have the honor of dying on the right path. And Ammar was so eager to die at Safin. Then finally, shortly before the battle intensified and he became a shaheed, he said, bring me a cup of milk, a drink of, a drink of milk. They told him why. He said, because Rasulullah told me, Ammar, the last thing you drink in this life before becoming a shaheed is a cup of milk. They brought him the cup of milk. He drank it, he went to the battlefield, he became a shaheed. That's Ammar ibn Yasir. So his parents had the honor of becoming a shaheed defending the Prophet. He had the honor of becoming a shaheed defending Imam Ali alayhi salam. Blessed family. The family of Yasir was a blessed family in Islam. Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anhu.